this is Coaching What Works in the Moment Classroom Coaching for K-12 Teachers. Got a moment? Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Tricia O'Hara, a lifelong classroom coach and teacher in pre-K through 12 at-risk schools and the creator of Coaching What Works, what they didn't teach you in teacher training. If you are a teacher, any kind of teacher, then this message is for you. If you've seen our other free videos, you have a pretty good idea by now what we do. Our sole purpose is to help you optimize your teaching to make real progress in closing that student achievement gap. We put tools based on significant foundational research into your hands and help you to reach skills proficiency easier, faster, better. So you can teach, no kidding, practically anything to practically anybody. Whether DIY or in peer coaching teams, you'll have surefire methodology that separates the successful teacher from the unsuccessful one. In this video, we're going to talk about coaching, specifically peer coaching, and then we're going to address some myths in our profession. But first, here's a pop quiz. True or false? Most teachers have rarely, if ever, seen another teacher teach. True. True or false? Most teachers have rarely, if ever, seen models of what they are asked to teach. True again. True or false? Most teachers have rarely, if ever, actively monitored all their students. That's true. True or false? Most teachers have misconceptions about explicit or direct teaching. True again. Want proof? Ask them. We're here to help you change that. Oh, speaking of change, I just want to thank you for the change you're helping to bring about through all the comments and questions you've been posting as part of this professional development product launch. Bottom line, teachers tell us every teacher needs to know this. This should be required professional development and no new teacher should be given her first class until she knows this. When teachers talk, I pay attention. We're glad you're paying attention too. So I just wanna say thanks. For those who don't know, here's my story. As a young teacher, I participated in early development of explicit teaching's powerful concepts, and I've been applying and refining them in K-12 at-risk classrooms ever since. I've trained teachers, coaches, paraprofessionals, and administrators in explicit instruction and other research-based practices through the National Institute for Direct Instruction, CORE, the Consortium on Reading Excellence, SRA McGraw-Hill, and at district, county, state, regional, national, and international levels of education. I've continued to delve into what emerging evidence tells us, what matters, and what does not. What I found out is that applying foundational research really, really works. Like peer coaching, for example. The number one finding of the 2009 Gates Foundation study of 40,000 teachers is, can you guess it? The number one thing that teachers want is a supportive environment where they can work together. So do students, by the way. No wonder brain studies show that we are literally hardwired to connect with other humans. Daniel Goleman's 2006 book, Social Intelligence, explains how research in a new field called social neuroscience uses brain scans to show that our brains are actually hardwired for sociability and connectedness. Our brains literally light up in the presence of others. The brain waves of humans who collaborate actually synchronize, possibly explaining participants' increased creativity and productivity. Brain research is still exciting new news. This revelation has enormous implications for how we teach children and how we learn as adults. We agree emphatically with the 40,000 teachers. We need to work together, literally, to genuinely connect face-to-face, -face, preferably in teams, in our own classrooms, where it counts. Intimidating at first, working together in classrooms soon proves invaluable. The truth is we are stronger and more creative together. We are greater than the sum of our parts. 19 years have passed since coaching gurus Beverly Showers and Bruce Joyce 
summarized the evolution of peer coaching in 1996. First proposing on-site peer coaching professional development in 1980, they continued to build a remarkable body of evidence to improve teaching. Their work is often the centerpiece of professional development literature today. We'll tell you more about current findings a bit later. Here's what Showers and Joyce discovered, I quote, regularly scheduled coaching sessions focused on classroom implementation and the analysis of teaching, especially students' responses, would enable teachers to practice and implement the content they were learning. The results were consistent. Implementation rose dramatically whether experts or participants conducted the sessions. Let me repeat that. Implementation rose dramatically whether experts or participants conducted the sessions. Why not create permanent structures, they asked, that would enable teachers to study teaching on a continuous basis? Despite three plus decades of staff development evidence that implementation rates soar from zero to five percent to ninety percent and greater with the addition of about 25 sessions of coaching, the classroom coach is still a rare animal. Today, the number of school districts using coaching in any form is still woefully small. While peer coaching is slowly finding its way into U.S. schools, we already know that it is a proven approach to change teacher practice. The coaching model is different from the traditional conception of pedagogy, where there's a presumption that after a certain point, the student no longer needs instruction. You graduate, you're done, you can go the rest of the way yourself. In Asia, Teacher training does not end upon graduation, it just begins. Senior teachers mentor new teachers. Working together, Asian teachers hone teacher skills and national curriculum content. Polished like stones, these are passed on from one teacher, one faculty, and one generation to another. International academic excellence is their result. U.S. school reform efforts have focused on developing professional learning communities, PLC. The idea is that we can solve problems together. We heartily agree. Early versions of PLCs were often book discussions centered around the conference table, eventually derided as collaboration by some PLC experts. While the content discussed around the conference table has since become more targeted, something more is needed. A very important shift is underway, moving collaboration into classrooms. Coaching means focusing on what counts most, the interaction between the teacher and the student and the curriculum, where it counts most, in your own classrooms. In 2010, the prestigious journal Education Week published a special report on professional development. Its key findings echoed Showers and Joyce. Take a look. Cutting edge professional development focuses not only on content, but on minute-by-minute -minute teaching decisions. Our participants call this work in-the-moment coaching, what we do best, and what teachers learn to do for each other. Peer coaching does this in teams. Dynamic, classroom-based peer coaching teams are the true heart of a PLC. You most certainly can do coaching what works as do-it-yourself professional development to transform your own teaching. 50% of participants say that coaching what works is so clear that it can work without a coach. It's entirely possible to take this journey solo, but if you ask other teachers to take the journey with you, you will have more fun, learn more, grow faster, and develop friendships among colleagues when you begin to share your own experience and knowledge with each other. Coaching What Works not only gives you new clarity and certainty in your own teaching, but taking focused action as a team results in exponential growth for the entire team. I repeat, taking focused action as a team results in exponential growth for the entire team, and it gives all future professional development more traction. Speaking of traction, coaching is gaining traction in U.S. schools. Most, however, is one-on-one -on -one coaching. Having support is always preferable to having no support, but our experience has proven without a doubt that peer coaching is far more impactful. Here's why. Coaching gurus Showers and Joyce have been studying coaching since the 1980s. 
their largely overlooked findings tell us that teachers require on average about 25 guided practice opportunities to incorporate anything new of substance into our teaching routine. Old habits die hard. Whether modeling or merely providing a lesson debrief, a single coach working with a single teacher will likely never hit this critical number, 25. But if a team of four to five teachers do micro-teaching, that is to watch each other practice applying any given element, such as how to teach vocabulary explicitly, in a very few coaching days, it becomes relatively easy to reach sufficient guided practice opportunities. Watching someone else teach often provides nearly as much value as teaching oneself, sometimes even more. Observers can focus because we're not responsible for teaching the lesson. Education Week's findings show that 30 to 100 hours of professional development are required to boost student scores. In other words, if our goal is to actually increase student achievement, then we must spend way more practice time than we now get in typical workshop professional development. Way more. Practice, practice, practice. This process is thoroughly engaging, even exciting. Personally, I learn something every time I watch another teacher teach. The research works. The process works. See for yourself. Watch the next free video coming right up. It's an interview with two super talented veteran site-based coached as they describe their experience. Definitely worth the watch. That's coming right up. But before that, let's talk about some myths in education. Don't expect me to be politically correct. From where I stand, there's way too much talk and not enough action. Life is short, and frankly, so is my patience. Are you ready for some myth busting? Myth number one, fix poverty so we can teach. Of course, poverty should be eliminated. I personally participated in the largest U.S. education study ever done during the U.S. government's war on poverty in the 1960s and 70s. We had a good run. We made real changes. We moved the needle. We dramatically raised achievement for poor kids. The percentage of Americans in poverty decreased. Today, today the gap between rich and poor is wider than ever. The advantaged among us will always strive to maintain their advantage. Jesus said that the poor will always be with us. We all know, and the research supports, that there are many variables to educational success. Some we cannot control, such as home and community variables or economic uncertainty. Our students come to us with many challenges that stand in the way of their learning. Teachers can't control these variables. As caring humans, we want to help, and perhaps in your particular situation, you can help, but really, they are not your job. Some variables we can directly control, such as curriculum and what teachers do. Your job is to teach the kids. Nobody else can do that but you. For the sake of our students, our responsibility is to optimize our skills. Sorry to say, the way many of us teach often leaves the majority of kids feeling like burnt out failures. Here's an example close to home. In a nearby school district of exceptional resources and relatively low risk factors, save only high ELL population, 88%, I repeat, an appalling 88% of third graders are failing to read at grade level. Do you know that third grade reading scores are a key determinant used to build new prisons? It's called the school to prison pipeline, and it's an educational failure of staggering proportions. A well-known author rails against her chosen twin evils of poverty and big business involvement in education. She gives us but a single throwaway line regarding teacher competencies. I quote, if teachers need help, they should get it. Great idea. Let's put our energy there. Forget about waiting for the end of poverty so you can teach. We must accept the students we are given and get on with it. Myth two, teaching is evolving from generation to generation. Wrong. Education historians say teaching has changed little in the last 100 to 200 years. Innovations have typically addressed working conditions or structural conditions such as reduced class size or school choice rather than the act of teaching. Just leave me alone to teach my own way is the common mantra. For example, 
Take influential educator John Gregory. In his 1884 publication, Seven Laws of Teaching, he writes, teaching is not telling. Everybody knows that we should engage students and do more than lecture. The question is how? The content of this slim little book remains as relevant today as it was in 1884, and it remains still largely unimplemented. Myth three, teacher education prepares teachers to succeed. Outsiders assume that teachers are taught to apply research during their training. This is simply not true. Lack of preparation is not teacher's fault. In 2006, the former president of Teachers College at Columbia University wrote the latest in a long line of exposés, warning, I quote, teacher education right now is the Dodge City of the education world. Like the fabled Wild West town, it is unruly and disordered. There is no standard approach to where and how teachers should be prepared. There is a chasm between what goes on in the university and what goes on in the classroom. The result? Lacking good models of effective methodology, most teachers default to teaching the way they themselves were taught. Who can blame us? I know you know what I mean. A famous trainer begins every workshop by saying, some of you are already doing what we will cover today. Some of you have tried and forgotten, and for some, this will be new information. After about 10 years of attending these trainings, I finally approached this trainer and asked, like you, I'm in many schools. Frankly, I see hardly anybody applying this research. Am I missing something? The trainer shocked me with a swift reply. You're right, it's pathetic, isn't it? Myth four, workshops work. By 1990, Harvard studies, among others, made clear that workshops don't work. We know that only about 10% of workshop attendees implement workshop content. No wonder, typical professional development often leaves the majority of teachers feeling confused, unsupported, and reluctant to try anything new when we return to the usual demands of our classroom. As one coach says, we keep asking for but rarely get to see a model of what we're supposed to do. Why do we persist in professional development that doesn't help us implement? Something more is needed. The good news is that a very important shift is underway, moving collaboration into classrooms where it counts. Myth five, practice makes perfect. Football coach Vince Lombardi got it right. Practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. Direct instruction pioneer Madeline Hunter made clear that practice is critical and that failure to do this step in a lesson or a unit is responsible for student failure to be able to apply something learned. Most students never achieve mastery and therefore are unable to confidently progress to next levels of difficulty or complexity. In his book Outliers, The Story of Success, Malcolm Gladwell stresses the 10,000 hour rule, claiming that the key to success in any field is to a large extent a matter of practicing a specific task for a total of around 10,000 hours. Studies suggest that the key to success has less to do with talent, it's simply practice, 10,000 hours of it, 20 hours a week for 10 years. Whether the correct amount is 10,000 hours or 20,000 or 5,000, the fact remains that we get good at what we practice. When was the last time you learned to do something well by trying it only once? Tennis, tango, French, knitting, got it? Let's face it, we may think we can, but try that overhead serve or forward ocho or pronunciation or pearl stitch. Most of us need several repetitions to feel confident doing something new. Our ingrained habits and self-talk get in the way. We like to have a little or a lot of hand-holding guidance along the way. With luck, we've had accurate models of what we are learning. Ironic, isn't it, that the field of education has lost sight of one of teaching's most basic considerations, the necessity of practice for both our students and for ourselves when it comes to our own PD. Here's an example, take that number 25. It appears from the practice research that there's something key about the number 25. The research on coaching tells us that teachers need about 25 discrete coaching episodes to incorporate most any new skill into their teaching behavior. Likewise, vocabulary research tells us that students need 
as much as 25 separate encounters with an unfamiliar word in order to incorporate it into their own vocabulary use. You and I both know we fall miles short of providing our students with sufficient, appropriate practice. So long as we sweep adequate practice under the rug, we will continue to get the results we now get. Myth six, higher order thinking motivates disengaged students. Give us a playful or serious challenge, a riddle, a puzzle, a mystery or a game, and most of us are hooked. Wonderful challenges, but we run the risk of making even greater failures of at-risk students if we buy this myth by putting the cart before the horse. The truth is students can't critically think if they don't know what leads to critical thinking. What we think is obvious is not at all clear to many kids. What prior knowledge, what vocabulary are needed to critically think? Escuchen, listen. Words build bridges. Words turn on the lights. Vocabulary makes the difference between student success and failure. If you are not teaching vocabulary explicitly, you are squandering students' precious time. As one of our participants said, it's amazing how much my kids can learn when they understand the vocabulary. Do your kids understand lesson vocabulary? How about prior knowledge? Do your students have models of metacognition? Have you modeled how to justify answers? Do all your students know how to access text? Do you provide adequate varied practice? These researchers, Stigler and Stevenson, authors of The Learning Gap and The Teaching Gap, studied extensively in Asia and Europe. They brought us the Japanese notion of lesson study. Remember that PD innovation? Whatever happened to that one? What they found behind those student math challenges that Asian countries are so famous for is that unglamorous proficiency in math facts always precedes their famously creative problem-solving ability. Myth 7. Constructivism good, explicit teaching bad. Let's start with what Hattie describes in Visible Learning. Quote, Every year I present lectures and education students and find that they are already indoctrinated with the mantra constructivism good, direct instruction bad. When I show them the results of these meta-analyses, they are stunned and they often become angry at having been given an agreed set of truths and commandments against direct instruction. Too often, Hattie says, what the critics mean by direct instruction is didactic, teacher-led talking from the front of the room which should not be confused with a very successful direct instruction method. Direct instruction, or explicit teaching, has a bad name, Hattie continues, for the wrong reasons, especially when it is confused with didactic teaching, since the underlying principles of direct instruction place it among the most successful outcomes." Close quote. Hattie enumerates these underlying principles. Explicit teaching's principal objective is to accelerate instruction. In a nutshell, learning intentions and success criteria are set, commitment and engagement built, lesson presentation is determined, including modeling, guided practice, checking for understanding and closure, followed by appropriately challenging independent practice. This is Madeline Hunter Redux. You've heard it before. You probably have written a lesson plan in college covering these very elements. For most teachers, that's where it ends. It's a rare teacher who has experience or permission to generalize and apply these principles in daily practice. Most of us are bound to faithfully implement whatever curriculum of the day has been chosen for us. Make no mistake, if you are a teacher who's successfully applying essential resource every day, then you are a hugely valuable resource to your colleagues. We need to observe and learn from you. Remember Project Follow Through? Here's the amazing ending to the story of the biggest educational study in U.S. history. Project Follow Through intended to find out how to best increase student achievement for disadvantaged students, and then to fund and disseminate widely what worked best. Overall, there were four full project evaluations done. One of the reviewers summarized it this way. Quote, increased amounts of money, people, materials, health and dental care, and hot lunches did not cause gains in achievement. 
The follow-through models that were based on self-directed learner approach were at the bottom of the academic and affective achievement. The cognitively oriented approaches produced students who were relatively poor in higher order thinking skills. And models that emphasized improving students' self-esteem produced students with the poorest self-esteem." In the end, federal funding and widespread dissemination was awarded not just to the clear success, direct teaching, but instead to models that were the clear failures in hopes that they would improve their outcomes. Philosophical values and preferences of the day trumped these clear results. The outcome data were discredited and ignored. Opinion triumphed over data. Talk about your Semmelweis effect. Similar programs with different names based on the notion of leaving students to discover knowledge on their own persist to this day. In reality, learning is not an either-or situation. Not just the philosophy of constructivism, not just the methodology of explicit teaching, it's both. We all construct our own knowledge. The question is, upon what skills, what information are we constructing that knowledge? Bottom line, our job is to give students code-breaking strategies. I repeat, our job is to give students code-breaking strategies so they can accurately construct knowledge, meet challenges, and solve problems collaboratively. Problems no generation has yet faced. It's not just a good idea. It's our duty to ensure our kids survive and thrive. Is explicit teaching the only way to teach? Certainly not. But if our students are accountable for what we teach, then explicit teaching is as close as we get to a sure thing. Let's bring things back to where we live, on the ground, in the trenches, in the ocean depths, in our classrooms where we still need to teach every day. The good news is that now you have a choice to make that's unaffected by the latest storm-tossed political seas. It's time for you to ask yourself, what do you need? to fill or fine-tune your own knowing-doing gaps? How will you optimize your skills so you can teach practically anything to practically anybody? Well, you've heard our story. It's time now for you to believe in yourself, in your students, and in your colleagues. You can change or improve your teaching habits and have fun doing it. Is it easy? Probably nothing worth doing is really easy. But we've made it as easy as possible. Is it simple? Yes, it's simple. Subject-free, curriculum-free, technology-free, condensed, plain-spoken, ready to use. You can start today. In the meantime, be sure to watch the next free video coming right up. Find out what seasoned site coaches familiar with navigating education's stormy seas have to say. See for yourself what this engaging process looks like from their perspective in Site Coaches Interview, the next video that awaits you. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this video. I just checked again in that huge body of largely unimplemented research. It's still out there for our profession to apply. I hope this helps you to picture how you can get the job done. We're here for you. If you haven't done so already, sign up with your name and email in the box to access immediately your next free video, Site Coaches Interview. Post your comments and questions below, and I will try to respond personally to as many as possible. And please share this with other teachers. Hit those share buttons. Grassroots, word of mouth, is the only way we distribute Coaching What Works. So let other teachers know. They may be looking for this opportunity too. See you in the next video. Thanks for the moment. This is Coaching What Works, in the moment, classroom coaching for K-12 teachers.